the topic of the presentation today uh, will focus more on the future of software, something that those of you who are young to the business or moving into the business or even have some fair amount of experience in the software business will be building over the first half of the 21st century. Uh, it's a topic that is close to my interests today and something that those of us uh, who've been around the business for a long time should be considering very, very carefully. So let's talk a little bit about a threat landscape. First, a little bit on logistics. Um, I'm going to kind of do this presentation without interrupting it to answer questions that you pose online as I'm talking. But I promise at the end, we'll address at least some of those questions in kind of a give and take discussion. So given all of this, let's get started. Or not. Uh, in this first slide, I'm kind of joking around a little bit. They call me in the business a dinosaur. And the reason that they call me a dinosaur is that because I've been working in the software business for almost five decades. That's a long time. In fact, it's longer than I would say probably everyone attending this webinar has been alive. Um, so you can appreciate that during that amount of time, I've learned a couple of things. And one of them is humility. Um, I've been working on software projects over those five decades, and I've encountered more than a few of those projects that have been 90% complete and stayed 90% complete for 150% of the project schedule. That gives just about anyone humility. I expect that some of you will have or have encountered that aspect of the software engineering world. Working for as long as I have, it also gives me a little bit of perspective. I've seen an awful lot change over all of these years, uh, and some things that haven't. And I've also kind of been able to understand what's transient in our business and what's persistent. Um, when I originally wrote my book, which is now in its eighth edition, um, I began with about 300 pages worth of material. In the eighth edition, there are 900 pages of material. So a reasonable amount has changed and been added to the software engineering world. And every year, we experience new challenges. But very soon, I think, as the software world begins to change fundamentally, things may begin to move too fast. Now, it's reasonable to ask, what do I mean when I say things will move too fast? We're beginning to, be, to build applications that are rather different than the applications that we built in the 20th century, for sure, and even through this point in time in the 21st century. We're building autonomous systems today that act on their own to achieve a goal set defined by its creators. The key difference in a true autonomous system is that very often there isn't a specific well-defined algorithm that it follows, but rather something closer or akin to machine learning, where the application autonomously learns from data mined from the infosphere. That in itself represents challenges because the actual implementation may not be what the software engineers who built the system expect. We'll also be looking at robotics, which might move too fast. And by that I mean we're going to go far beyond CNC, computer numerical control, where every aspect of a robot's actions have been pre-programmed. Modern robots, as we move into the 21st century, will use AI, artificial intelligence. They'll learn by observation rather than explicit programming. And that will present us with some interesting problems and interesting issues. We also already see, and will continue to see, advanced voice and image recognition. And that will make any automaton that we build more human-like. That, therefore, will result in users of a system attributing human characteristics to what they're looking at without really understanding that possibly what they're looking at isn't quite human. 
we are moving into an era of artificial intelligence. That happened long ago. When I initially went to graduate school, my dissertation was on an aspect of artificial intelligence. But that was in its infancy at that period. Today, we've come a bit of a way, but not as far as any of us thought back when I wrote my dissertation. However, progress is occurring very rapidly now and may begin to occur exponentially as we move forward. The key is, what will all this mean? Where will we be going? In order to really understand where we're going, it might be a good idea to look backward from a software engineering perspective for just a moment. I know all of you know this, but, but indulge me for a moment. Uh, in the 20th century, a long time ago now, uh, software engineers did what software engineers do. They analyzed problems. They designed adequate solutions at an architectural, a component, and a code level. They ultimately built those solutions and then tested them to form software and systems that were viable. They then integrated those systems into industrial products, consumer electronics, IT systems, mobile electronics, and the like. They built very constrained human interfaces, actually, with established interaction protocols. For example, for the past 15 or 20 years, the window point-and-click interface has been the dominant prescribed interaction protocol. I suspect, without doubt, that's going to change very, very soon. And of course, during the 20th century, uh, software engineers produced millions of lines of code, some good, some not so good, dedicated to that specific goal set. We still do a lot of this, and we'll still continue to do a lot of this, but it is unquestionably old school thinking. The real issue is where we will go as we move further into the 21st century. Um, if, if we think about that a little bit, I think the dominant technology that's going to change the world for just about everyone and will certainly change the role and the activities of software engineers is artificial intelligence. As I've already mentioned, um, we, we're already seeing significant improvements in, in voice and image recognition. Those will continue and become astoundingly good over the next five years. Um, there are massive efforts at data mining, uh, big data as it's called. And that will lead, as we'll talk about a bit later, to ways of connecting data that we've never been able to do before. And we're all, we'll also be encountering machine learning. We were already doing a, quite a bit of this, but we're going to go far beyond existing things like artificial neural nets and moving into some really sophisticated machine learning approaches that I think will lead us ever closer to an artificial intelligence that, as we'll learn later in this talk, I perceive as a threat. 21st century systems will begin to mimic human function and understanding. Later on in this talk, we'll talk a little bit about how humans and machines will merge. And if you don't think that's going to happen, look at any teenager in the United States or in India. A teenager, a teenager has his or her mobile with them constantly, always looking at it, always using it, always relying on it for everything from social interaction to answering a question about who starred in a specific movie. The key is that if you observe closely, you'll notice that that teenager has begun to merge with his or her mobile device. It is part of them. And that's a little bit spooky for us old timers. Spend some time looking at it, you'll see. At the end of the day, that's the very beginning of a merger that will become very important and possibly a little bit scary. It's also part, as we'll see, of the threat landscape. All of this will result in fluid interfaces and interactions that don't necessarily follow predictable patterns like we see today. 
it'll also result in systems, artificial intelligence systems, producing results that are not immediately apparent. In other words, we'll understand the result, but not how the system got there. It's interesting, uh, the developers of IBM's Watson were questioned on how it came to develop some of the answers it developed to win Jeopardy. That's a quiz show in the United States. The AI beat Jeopardy champions from across the country, hands down, beat them easily. And developers of Watts are asked, how does it come up with these answers? And you know what? They really couldn't answer that question except in broad generalities. That's a little bit spooky. Let's continue, if we will, by big picture. And the big picture that we want to start with is a simple quote. This by Eliezer Yudkowsky. He's an AI writer, a researcher, and an advocate of what he calls friendly AI. He says, by far, the greatest danger of artificial intelligence is that people conclude too early that they understand it. Now, back when I was working in graduate school, I thought I understood AI. I was absolutely wrong. I didn't even begin to understand it. Today, most developers and researchers would argue that they understand AI. But I'm not sure they do. Well, what is the threat of that? What is the problem with not understanding? The threat landscape that I and many other people, old timers in the business, see comes in three different categories. The first has been with us for a very long time. The second, much shorter. And the third is something that will happen in the future. The first is automation, that machines replaces, re replace humans at a rate that is disruptive. We'll talk about that in a moment. The second threat in the landscape is that machines act autonomously in ways that are difficult to predict or control. Now, you'd think that an autonomous machine would be something wonderful, and it could be, but that's only true if it does what we think it should do, if it uses what I'll call common sense, and if we can control it in some meaningful way. And finally, the third threat, the future, the thing that Hollywood in, in the United States is making movies about, and that is strong AI, or what we call the intelligence explosion. And we'll talk about that at some length as well. All of these threats will use software, and much of, those, of that software will be developed by you or people like you. It's a good thing if you understand the threat landscape. And if you think the word threat is too strong a term, uh, we can use the word risk as its replacement but it really matters not. Let's take a look at each of these individually. The first threat is what we call the labor substitution problem. And that is that we apply automation to a variety of, of human jobs, human activities. The obvious target is low skill labor, for example, manufacturing labor. But today, there is a new, a new target. And that is what has classically been called, in the, in, in the United States anyway, white collar functions. The threat of the labor substitution problem, when AI is applied, applies not only to factory workers or other relatively low skill workers. And I don't mean to denigrate anyone, I just mean that they are relatively low skill. The new threat is automated pharmacists, automated lawyers, automated journalists, auto automated medical diagnosticians like radiologists and the like. You can see the list there. Ultimately, possibly, even automated software engineers, but that's something a bit off. The key here is that the labor substitution problem, as AI becomes stronger, can become rather disruptive. And that's something that society has to deal with and that software engineers who build these systems have to manage. Automatons, as they become less expensive, 
force the cost of labor to become relatively more expensive. And that means that as automatons grow cheaper and cheaper, they will invade areas that currently they have no uh, application in. Well, the labor substitution problem is, to some extent, the least of the threats. I think society can manage that. I think we can handle it without great difficulty, although it does present problems. The second threat, however, is autonomous systems. An autonomous system operates in ways that are independent of direct human control. I have a car. It's an electric car. It's an electric car that can drive itself on the highways. Drive itself on the highways right now, today. I take my hands off the wheel. I can read a book. I can do whatever I want to do. And it drives itself. Only on interstate roads, it avoids cars. It changes lanes. It slows down when cars are, 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 are ahead. It's aware of cars all around it. It would work really, really well in Delhi. I've observed that here. A lot less horn honking. But fundamentally, it's rather shocking the first time one gets in it and uses it. Because as a human, I give up control to the car. That's not really a threat. That's just advancing technology. But what happens if we develop autonomous systems in which unintended actions occur based on what we might call unpredictable inputs? Do we have the ability to bound actions, even though we think we can? Um, is it possible to build systems that have common sense? And can we control runaway operations? Even more scary is when autonomous systems are weaponized. And at least in some countries, the departments of defense in those countries are working hard to build autonomous weaponized system. Is that ethical? Is it a good idea for human beings? I'm not going to even try to answer that, but it's something that software engineers should think about. The big questions here are how do we test an autonomous system? How do we judge liability? Who's responsible when things go awry? For example, if my car were to crash into another car, who's responsible? Well, I am in the United States. But realistically, the software is responsible because I wasn't driving the car. The software was. Finally, how do we establish control and constraint within that context? That's still another issue that we need to address when we're building autonomous systems. Is this threat critical? I would argue it's serious. But again, I think that if we're smart as software engineers and as a society, that we can control it. I'm concerned about it, but not greatly concerned. But now we come to the last level of threat. And here, things begin to become a little bit weird. There is, in the software engineering software community, a relentless push to develop what we call an AGI, an Artificial General Intelligence. It's been the goal of software people for the past 50, 60 years. That is, an artificial intelligence that is indistinguishable from a human being. Do I think we'll get there? Soon. Typical projections are sometime within the next 20 years. That's not a long time. But even that, if that were all that happened, is probably manageable. Sitting down and having a conversation with an AGI would be fascinating. It would exhibit the intelligence of a, of a human being, would have the contextual base of a human being, would be able to respond like a human being. That would be pretty cool. But that's not where it stops. And now we come to the threat. Once developed, the AGI will be improved and eventually improve itself until it becomes a superintelligence.
In other words, it will get smarter, more capable, more all-seeing, until it exhibits an intelligence that might be 10 times more powerful than a human being, 100 times, 1,000 times, who knows? The bottom line is none of us, no matter how much they claim otherwise, can conceive of what a superintelligence really is. When you or I meet a genius, a true human genius today, they are much smarter than us, but only marginally smarter, 30% smarter, 20% smarter. What if we were in, to encounter an entity that was a thousand times smarter? We have no idea what that means. And that means the impact on humans will be profound and could be catastrophic, what we call in the business an X risk. That means an existential risk, a risk to all of us, a serious risk. We'll talk more about this a bit later, but it's something to kind of think about as we begin to proceed more fully forward. Let's continue our discussion just a bit. If, in fact, I'm the only person who's worried about this, you probably shouldn't pay any attention. But there are some very smart people who have begin, begun to worry about it. In fact, the very first, one would call it, seminal article on this subject was written by Bill Joy, a computer scientist and chief scientist at, at then Sun Microsystems in 2001. He wrote an article in IEEE software entitled, The Future Doesn't Need Us. And what he talked about was a superintelligence. Once a superintelligence was derived, he argued, human beings really are no longer very important. Well, we do a lot of other things, but no less. It was a warning in 2001. More recently, true geniuses like Stephen Hawking said development of a full AI, a superintelligence, could spell the end of the human race. I don't know. Uh, that sounds pretty scary. There may, in fact, be some truth to it. And Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla Motors and SpaceX, and I think uh, the Henry Ford of our generation, called AI in general our biggest existential threat. Many, many, many other people are beginning to be concerned about what we call X risks. Let's talk a little bit more about this. Uh, I believe it is something to worry about. I believe that young software engineers should be thinking about this as they're tasked with develop, de developing uh, systems that have artificial intelligence components or working on artificial intelligence applications in general. We have an immense internet-connected info, infosphere, and that allows an AI to access huge amounts of disparate data, achieving unusual connections, and therefore attaining in its own way powerful insight that might be beyond the abilities of a human. We're going to see rapidly improving machine learning algorithms. One of the problems, however, is that a lot of those algorithms are what are called genetic. And that means that in some ways they improve themselves with the highest genetic component taking the lead. That means that software engineers may not have a very good handle on exactly how those algorithms work. That's not a good thing. And of course, as I've mentioned, we have the ability to process spoken and visual information at near human-like levels. We're seeing an awful lot of articles written on AI in the last year, actually. Uh, this from Ted Greenwald in the Wall Street Journal, can machines capable of autonomous reasoning, so-called general AI, be far behind the ideas that I just mentioned? And at that point, what's to keep them from improving themselves until they have no need for humanity? Now, some of you may think this is an overstatement or a big English word, what we call hyperbole. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, back at the turn of the century, a lot of software people 
were uh, sending out warnings about the Y2K problem. Some of you were old enough, I, I suspect, to remember that. I was not one of them. I was publicly stating at that time that there wasn't much to be concerned about, that a lot of the warnings that were made at that time were simply hyperbole. Turned out I was right. Now, today, I'm the analogy of those people in talking about AI. It may be that I'm wrong, but it also may be that I'm right. And if I'm right, this is something that software engineers need to worry themselves about a little bit. Artificial general intelligence. Within decades, the AI, the AI landscape is going to lead us to strong AI. And the characteristics of strong AI are represented on this slide. Uh, strong AI will exhibit an, an ability to learn and learn very quickly from disparate information sources. They'll be able to process information effectively have the ability to recognize patterns. And if you think about it for a moment, human beings are pattern recognizers. It's what we do best. They used to say in the software biz that computers, using that general term, although frankly really what they meant was software with some sensors, would never be able to recognize a human face. Well, that was wrong because today we have facial recognition systems that are really very, very powerful. And that's just the beginning. Once an artificial intelligence begins to recognize patterns coming out of a variety of different data points, there will be almost no limit to what it can contribute to our understanding of the world, but also to what it can do. And that's something we have to think about a bit. Um, also, an AGI, an artificial general intelligence, will have the ability to reason and plan across a broad range of natural and abstract domains. It will be able to understand context. It will be able to communicate with us at a human-like level. And that's really pretty exciting. I mean, I would want to work on the project that built such a system. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, if it stopped right there, I'd be, I'd be cool with it. And in fact, as I said, that project is already ongoing. The question is who's going to get there first and when is it going to happen? Software developers haven't really given lip service, let alone serious thought, to any safety concern or ethical qualm related to the creation of artificial minds. That comes from Nick Bostrom the writer of a book called Superintelligence that I'll talk about in a few moments. It turns out that he's absolutely right. Most of us, including me to some extent, are so excited about the idea of creating an artificial mind that we don't really spend much thinking on any safety concerns or ethics involved with doing it. Um, after all, it's really cool to build things, particularly things like an artificial mind. But I think it's time for us in the software business because we're the folks who will do it to step back and say what are the safety concerns what are the ramifications of doing this now we already use AI and will use AI in a variety of, of, of ways within the software engineering world the list is shown on the slide in front of you I'm not going to go through each of the, the those topics because it turns out that each one of them would be the, the subject of a webinar on its own. But software engineers moving into the 21st century will use artificial intelligence applications for everything from aspect and pattern mining to quality assurance to reverse engineering to project management or risk assessment. It will help us do our jobs, particularly when we're working on 20th century kinds of applications more conventional IT, embedded software, the kinds of things that we did back in the 20th century and continue to do right into the 21st. But the big question is what might it do in terms of creating problems for software engineers who begin to rely or overly rely on the AI to do their work for them? 
that becomes a, a substantial issue and one that we really do have to consider moving forward. And as we do, we will build more AI using AI to help us as software engineers. We'll have the domain of conventional software. We'll have the domain of AI software. And as I note on this slide, software engineers will integrate existing IT, mobile, and embedded software into an AI infrastructure. And that means that will contribute to the direction and the height of the trajectory to which AI flies, at least at the beginning. The question is, what happens after the beginning? The AI systems, the AI in the systems that we build are all about creating something more human-like, interfaces and information and processing that becomes more human-like. It's no longer, for example, about designing human-machine interfaces. That's very 20th century. It is about building systems that merge with human activity. You recall earlier I said that young people were already merging with their mobiles. Well, that's true. But what happens when we go much, much further than that? When we have direct ocular implants, direct brain implants, that's coming, folks. It may sound like science fiction. It isn't. The question is, who develops the software for those things? How controllable is the software? How do we quality assure it? How do we test it? How do we ensure that its design is solid and that it will create no harm? And as we move to build AI software into systems within the merger, how do we build in self-control and self-constraint? No one really knows today. Some people might claim they do, but no one really knows. How do we build in the stops, as we call them, to protect the system and those who use it from the system? and from unanticipated situations in which the learned or algorithmic logic turn out to be wrong. Not to mention the, the security concerns associated with somebody hacking a direct brain implant, an ocular implant, or any other uh, situation which interacts directly or merges directly with human beings. A quick pause for a drink of water. Let's move onward. The idea of intelligence existing in some form that's not human seems to have a deep hold in the human psyche. That was said a long time ago by Don Perlis, who's a famous computer scientist. Now think about that quote for a moment. It really does grab us all. Think about Hollywood, California, uh, and think about the movies on AI that have come out over the last four or five years. It seems that the entertainment industry is obsessed by the concept of AI. And they sometimes say that science fiction, which is what they think those movies are, is a harbinger for the real world of the future. It turns out that I think that's the case. And yet the idea has a deep hold on our psyche. And that's why so many people are so excited about it. I mean, if I look at you as an audience, I would say by raising hands, how many of you would want to be on the team that develops the first artificial general intelligence. How many of you would be willing and want to work on the team that gets close to building the first human-like application where you can sit and talk to a machine, to software, and the software would be human-like, would react. And then how many of you would want to work on the first robotics application where the software of the general intelligence 
is embedded into a humanoid type of robot that could do wonderful things like caring for the elderly or removing toxic waste when it does happen or working in dangerous or, or, or bad environments, that would be unquestionably a very exciting thing for you to do. I would want to do it. And I suspect that many of you would, if not all of you would as well. It would be very cool software to work on. But then again, how many of you would go further? How many of you would be willing to work on weaponizing an automaton? And in fact, using that weaponized automaton to, well, let's be blunt, kill people. That's not so good. And that is going to come. And software engineers are going to do it. Is it ethical? Is it appropriate? Do we really want an artificial intelligence to work in those worlds? Those are difficult ethical questions. And I don't have the answers for them. But I will think, or I will say, it's reasonable to raise them if no other place, at least in a, in a simple little webinar like this. Now, if we think a bit about what the future may hold, after getting all excited about this and, and, and noting the existential risks, uh, that future can have what I would argue to be three outcomes. The first outcome uh, represented by people like Ray Kurzweil, for example, who's been a writer, a prolific writer on artificial intelligence, um, well worth reading, um, is the, what we call the utopian view. And that view says that there's really no need to worry. What Roger Pressman is saying is, is, is really of, of, of no concern. And that things will work out really, really well when we build an artificial general intelligence, we will achieve limitless prosperity. We'll end poverty and hunger. We'll achieve immortality, possibly by downloading our brain into an artificial brain. Who knows? We, may, we might even colonize the galaxy. We'll be able to develop resources that today we could only dream of. Everything will be truly wonderful. Well, that is one view. But history has taught us that few technological achievements result only in a utopian view. If you want an example, think of atomic energy. A wonderful achievement technologically. If used only in a utopian view, limitless clean energy. Uh, but that's not what happened. Humans, sadly, have a unique way of screwing those kinds of things up. And I suspect that we may encounter that as we move ever closer to an AGI. So what's another view? Well, the other view is the opposite end of that spectrum. What we call a dystopian view. That's a bad utopia, essentially. That will occur if, in fact, we're not careful. This from Nick Bostrom, uh, written in a book called Superintelligence. By the way, well worth a read if you're interested in this subject. He states, we humans are like small children playing with a bomb. Such is the mismatch between the power of our plaything and the immaturity of our conduct. Superintelligence is a challenge for which we are not ready now and will not be ready for a long time. We have little idea when the detonation will occur, though if we hold a device to our ear, we can hear a faint ticking sound. Nicely written. It turns out that Bostrom is one of the many people who are warning us that the road toward or the trajectory toward an AGI is fraught with potential risk, with threat. His view is things will turn out badly. Well, that may be the case. And I've kind of given you the implication that I fall closer to the dystopian view than the utopian view. And if you've taken that implication, I would argue you're probably correct. But there is 
a third view. And that is what we call the prototopian view. Prototopia is a state that is better today than yesterday, although it might be only a little better. Prototopia is much harder to visualize because it contains as many new problems as new benefits. If we handle things well, I suspect that the trajectory toward artificial general intelligence and the trajectory for software engineers who build that software will probably be closer to prototopian than either utopian or dystopian. The reason for that is that great good will come out of it, but also potential threat. So, in fact, what we really need to do as software engineers is look backward at what the IEEE talks about when it talks about a software engineering's role in technology and in society. In essence, they kind of state a Hippocratic oath for software engineers by saying, first, do no harm. The systems that you build, the systems that you work on, the projects that you, that you develop over time should first do no harm, avoid harm to others. But beyond that, the IEEE and the ACM also state that thorough evaluations of computing systems and their impacts with special emphasis on possible risks are something that all software engineers should do. Um, I think that's something that's very important. I think that's really the only message I'd like you to take away from this presentation. I think that fundamentally, um, as we move further into the 21st century, some of you will be faced with ethical challenges with regard to the development of AI software either on its own or embedded into a variety of different systems that you might be working on. In some cases, the AI will be innocuous, but in other cases, it may be that uh, we may encounter situations where great harm or threat can come of the software that we build. And it's very important that you spend the time thinking about this today and then reacting to it as it occurs in the future. If you do that, the trajectory for software in the 21st century for you guys will be exciting, will be exceptionally challenging, and will lead to some pretty good outcomes. If you don't do that, then we have a threat landscape, and then we'll be forced to manage it. I only hope that we can. That's the end of my webinar presentation, uh, but I would be happy to address any, any, any questions uh, if, if you have any. I'm trying to scan through here to see what we've got, if, if, if anything. Let me just see. Bear with me for a second. Okay, hold up. I, I ask you to bear with me for just a second. Okay, there's a question, really a software engineering question, which is a good one. Uh, it's a good, hard one to answer. I'll, I'll read it. I, I, I want to identify the person for privacy reasons. I am doing research in object recognition from video frames. I'd like to know which process model and testing methodology best suits to validate my research work. Research work uh, in general, regardless of the application area, is almost always iterative. Um, so we need to create a process model that is agile and that is iterative. If you can achieve those two things, you're probably moving in the right direction. It turns out that in, there's one more issue in, 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 in the research domain, and that is you need to be considerably agile. You need to be adaptive. You need to create a process model from a software engineering point of view that is not ponderous, that will lead, if you will, to progress without weighing down the solution. Uh, 
let me see if I can find another someone here. Uh, okay, I'm just reading. Sorry, give give me a second. Okay, somebody somebody make makes a statement. However, autonomous and mature robot systems will develop. They will always miss the emotional part of being a human being. I, I don't deny that, but let's be careful here. Um, I don't want to get into a broad uh, a discussion of what a human being is because that's tricky. I will, however, tell you that is a human being really the component, the component of the various aspects of one brain, one's thinking, one's sensory inputs. What is human? That's something that we're going to have to address. I'm not suggesting that artificial general uh, intelligence will replace a human being. What I am suggesting is that an artificial general intelligence can evolve into a super intelligence and a super intelligence might very well threaten human beings and that's not something that one should take trivially. Uh, another question, is there any focus or attempt being made in taking these inputs and, uh, wait, it's moving on me, help, <laughs> uh, hold up, uh, let's see, is there any focus or attempt being made in taking these inputs and strengthening software engineering and universe ac ac acad academics, in other words, are these topics discussed the, 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 when, when, when we're building, when we're educating future software engineers? Well, I, I'm sure some professors talk about this in passing. I think, frankly, we should be spending a lot more time on ethics for, for software engineering students. We generally don't do that. Sure, some universities have a course in it, but it's not something that's emphasized. I do think it, it would be very important, at least in passing, to introduce some discussion of this into every software engineering uh, uh, curriculum in academia. And frankly, it also introduces at a graduate level because most of the AI research going on today occurs at a graduate level, obviously. Um, but in addition, I think we need to, a big word here, inculcate it into startup firms. Uh, in, in the United States, I can't tell you how many young startups, well-funded startups, are moving into AI. And the key here is we want them, I think, to do the needful, as you guys would say, to do the right thing. And that may or may not happen if we don't take ethical concern, concerns into, in, in, into play. So that's something else we want to do. Uh, let's see, I'm scanning here. Okay, there's a, there, there's a question here. Uh, that I, I, okay, it's, it's, it's a good question. I'm not going to answer it, but it is a really good question. So I want to at least give the person credit for asking it. Uh, can I give a few more points about aspect and pattern mining um, software systems? Uh, all right, I'll answer it a little bit. Um, it, it, it turns out that one of the great challenges uh, in, our, in our world today is doing pattern-based design in the software engineering world. One of the problems is finding the, the appropriate pattern. I mean, you know, we can, we can create lots of software patterns, but the key is how do we find them? How do we navigate a pattern library? How do we build that library? How do we categorize it? How do we do all the things that make pattern-based design difficult? And AI could be an enormous help in that domain. It could find patterns in existing code, extract those patterns, possibly even clean the patterns up so that they would be generic or generally applicable. Um, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's just a very, very quick e example. Aspects are the same thing, fundamentally. You know, it, it's very nice to talk about aspect-oriented design, but try doing it. It isn't quite as simple as it sounds. a great uh, intellectual challenge. What we want to do, however, is turn it into a pragmatic uh, ability, and that, I think, will be greatly aided by AI as we, as we move forward. Uh, let me see. Okay, somebody early on in, in the in the in the uh, uh, d discussion, I mentioned my 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 uh, uh, a car and that it drives itself. And somebody uh, uh, kind of kind of said, uh, "Well, what about vehicles that were hacked recently? Uh, for example, the uh, Tesla Model S." Um, well, yeah, those vehicles were hacked, but they were hacked at the request of Tesla. Um, they asked a, a bunch of high high end white hat hackers. 
to, to try to hack their system. The reason was to learn how to protect it. The thrust of your question, though, is a very, very uh, important one, and that is how do we build secure AI? How do we build systems that are secure? We're still struggling with this. We're doing a better job today than we did 10 years ago, but uh, in, in English, in, in, in the U.S., we say where there's a will, there's a way. Um, there are lots of hackers with a lot of time on their hands and nothing else to do. So what they do, and they're bright, so what they do is they can hack into systems even though we try to provide uh, uh, protections as best we can. Um, we just have to learn to do a better job. Another question, um, or maybe it's more of a statement. He said, uh, this, this commenter said, we may merge into AI machines like mobile phones today. Um, that may just be reflecting something that I said. I, I, I really, I was, at a, I was at a wedding recently, okay, I was at a wedding. Um, and there were lots of, of, of very young girls, teenage girls there. And they were on the floor dancing, okay? Okay, that's what teenage girls do. And it was cute and, 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 and funny. But the one thing I noticed that was fascinating is all of them were dancing and holding their, their, their mobiles in their hands. And as they were dancing, they were looking at the mobile. This is while music is playing at a wedding. They were looking at the mobiles, taking selfies of themselves as, in fact, they were dancing. They and the machine were an extension of their arm. And they had their party dresses on, and they were very cute and young and, 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 and silly. But the mobiles became them. And that's really what I mean by, by, by uh, merging with a machine. Let me, let me uh, uh, come down here. Let's see. There's an awful lot of questions. I'm, I'm very pleased. I'm not going to be able to answer all of them. There are a lot of good questions here. Let me, let me just, just bear, bear with me for a second. Ones that I, because some of them are very complex. I wish I could answer them. We don't have the time. Uh, somebody suggests a uh, uh, new, new course uh, introduced at, at, at a university for, called, called Secure Software Engineering. Those courses are being offered. I think they're critically important, critically important. Um, there, there are a, a, a variety of, of, of general topic areas, software risk analysis, software safety, secure software engineering. All of those things, I think, are, are uh, uh, well worthwhile, well within the range. Um, a professor uh, is asking, are there new design approaches that represent artificial general intelligence? How does this type of knowledge, how will this, this type of knowledge represent, representation appear? That's an excellent question. Uh, there, there, there are lots of machine learning approaches. I, I, I think if you're talking about a generalized design approach, I would say not really today. And I'm not sure we'll ever be able to achieve a generalized design approach. I mean, you know, we could, we could consider genetic programming as a design approach, I suppose. But to my knowledge, and, and, and again, I don't follow this day to day, but to my knowledge there is no generic uh, uh, or, or general approach that I would that I would suggest for doing this sort of thing um, okay another question uh, good evening to you um, what is what is the margin the question is what is the margin between artificial intelligence and gen, and, and super intelligence there's a wide margin between the artificial intelligence that we're doing today and superintelligence. There is a smaller margin between artificial general intelligence and superintelligence. Remember, we're, we have not achieved artificial general intelligence. That is true human-like intelligence. That will happen, best guess, between 2035 and 2040. That is well within the working lifetime of, I would guess, almost everybody watching this webinar. Not me, but everybody else. Uh, that's very exciting. But the question is, what is that margin between AGI and superintelligence? Well, here's the thing. If the intelligence is artificial and general intelligence, that means it's human-like. Now think about yourself. You can write an algorithm, can you not? factor that algorithm and improve it. Is that the correct? I, I, I think everybody would agree, yes, it is. Well, if you can do it, an AGI can do it. So now the question is, 
if the AGI begins improving itself, it looks at its source code, if source code is the way it manifests, and says, hmm, I can factor that source code. I can improve my own design. And it does that incrementally, just a tiny bit, 1%. It becomes 1% faster, smarter, more contextual, whatever. Well, now that faster, smarter, more contextual AGI says, oh, wait, I can factor my code again and make it another percent. But remember, it's doing this at the speed of light. So fundamentally, the 1% increase can happen repeatedly very, very quickly. And before you know it, the margin, as you put it in your question, between an AGI and a superintelligence begins to blur because the AGI is becoming a superintelligent. First is 10% smarter than a human being, then 100% smarter, then 1,000%, then 10,000%, then we're in trouble. Because at 10,000%, what is it thinking? What is it doing? What are its goals? What are its objectives? How do we control? Remember, it's 10,000% smarter than you. It can convince you to do anything it wants just as you can convince a child to do anything you want it to do, really. You've heard of child psychology? Well, you're smarter than a child, so you can convince it. Well, you would be a child to the superintelligence. Sounds like science fiction? I suspect it will happen within the lifetime of everybody watching this webinar, except me. And that's okay. Okay, I've been here for a while. It's okay. But what I'm trying to warn you of is to try to uh, uh, watch out for this and treat it, treat it with respect, treat the technology with respect, handle it appropriately, and I think we'll all be better off as a society. I have to go because we've been here for about an hour. I'd again really like to thank you all for spending the time with me. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope it gave you something to think about. Uh, and I wish you the very best of luck as you move forward in your software engineering endeavors. Thanks again for attending the seminar. Bye.